you for the opportunity to, to be here in this place. God, as we celebrate uh, Christ the King, we thank you for your Son. We thank you for loving us enough to send him to us so that we might be restored, so that we might be made anew. And Father, I pray this morning that as we hear your word proclaimed, uh, that you will open our ears, that you will open our minds, that you will open our hearts so that we hear your word, that we understand it, and that, Father, it speaks to us in a way that we're transformed. Father, in the midst of our running, in, in the midst of our failures, we thank you for chasing after us relentlessly for loving us unconditionally. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning. It's, uh, it's great to be here with you this morning. And this is, a, this is a special day as we celebrate Christ the King, as we take an opportunity to explore the true identity of Christ and what his kingship means to each of us. And this is kind of special on a day like today for we are looking towards a season of caring for one another, of, of loving one another, of spending time together um, with family. And today, in anticipation of this time, we're going to kind of revisit specific times throughout the history of God's salvation, of the salvation story of God seeking after us and chasing after us. This morning, if we were to open our Bibles to the Old Testament, Scripture provides an account of God's unending desire to seek after His creation. And as the people of God, you and me this morning, as the people of God, we can see ourselves in the ebbs and the flows of Scripture. We can see ourselves in the ebbs and flows of God's people. Times when we get it right, as well as times when we fail. Times of obedience, times of great faithfulness, as well as times of chaos, as we promote our own self-interest, as we act in opposition to our Creator. So in the midst of this history that began in the Garden of Eden and as it continues on this very morning today, there's one constant, one unchanging thing that remains unaltered. And that is our Creator, the God of Abraham, the God of, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, that He chases after us, relentlessly seeking us, that He gave His Son so that we might be transformed into His people, that we might exist in harmony within this kingdom where Christ reigns supreme as king and we are his children living in an attempt to glorify him in all that we do. This morning we come and join together to celebrate this Christ the King Sunday. In this celebration, this feast of Christ the King, it was instituted by Pope Pius XI in 1925. So it's not a, it's not a super old tradition in the life of our church, but it's a very important tradition, for this was made in response to the growing worldwide rejection of Christ as King. This came at a time of growing secularism in Europe in the mid-20s. The main reason for this feast, for the celebration of Christ the King, was so that the existing faithful, those who called themselves followers of Christ, would gain strength and courage in the midst of such adversity, in the midst of a world filled with sin, in the midst of a world turning its back on the idea that Christ is the one and true King. And as they were reminded that Christ must reign supreme in their hearts and in their minds, that those who proclaim with their mouth, that proclaim with their heart that Christ is indeed Lord and Savior would be an example of God's kingdom here on earth. This reminder... Christ the King Sunday came at a time when humanity's efforts had yielded the Industrial Revolution, when the Enlightenment had influenced people to realize their capacity for greatness, to realize that they could be their own kings, that their ability to reason and to think and create had given them almost a godlike power that knew no bound. In a sense, this was a time when mankind said, I have no need for religion, I have no need for the church. For I can be my own God. I can be my own king. I don't need to depend on others or anyone else other than my own ability. This reminder came at a time when the accumulation of wealth and the accumulation of resources was so great that it had altered society into what was almost a mob that began to seek after its own self-interest and its own 
well-being. This reminder of Christ the King Sunday in 1925 came at a time when the hope for a better tomorrow was no longer sought from the Scripture and the words of the Gospel, but rather it was fueled by individual accomplishment, by humanism, as society had grown to become its own king, as God was slowly replaced through my desire for ambition and my desire for greed. It was in the light of these times that Pope Pius XI suggested the church add a day, add a feast that put an emphasis back on the notion of Christ as King of all to remind us, to serve as a reminder of what that means for each of us, for how we live that out in our daily lives. Those of us who have been transformed by His grace, that have been transformed by His blood. When we look at this day, the Sunday, Christ the King, it's no wonder the placement of today's celebration as it falls just a few days before we began a wonderful season of Advent. For next week, we'll come together as a community of faith. We'll come together as a body of believers and we will begin this journey through the season of Advent as we celebrate a time that calls for serious reflection on the birth of Christ as well as a time of hope and anticipation of His glorious return. This will be a season when we revisit the initial chapters from Matthew, when we'll look at the initial chapters of Luke and we see the Christ story, the story of the infant in the manger, the birth of our Messiah. But it's also a time when we are called to a renewed sense of longing as we await the return of Christ Jesus our King as He comes to abolish the presence of sin, to bring forth restoration in each of us and to usher in a time when God and His creation will dwell together in harmony. In a sense, Advent contains an already, but not yet since. As we look to the gospel and we revisit this through both perspectives. But church, I want to warn you of something. And I want to warn myself of something. As we are on the threshold of this season, as we are on the threshold of Advent, we're lost if we enter this season without a firm understanding of who Christ Jesus was and why He is. You see, our posture and understanding and our calling within the kingdom of God where Christ reigns supreme within us, it cannot be a solely emotional time. It cannot just be a ritual where we come together and feel good about one another. When we love the decorations and we love the music, but as we enter Advent, it is to be a time where our posture comes in the presence of humility, where our experience and reflection brings us through Advent is based on our understanding of Christ's identity as Lord and Savior and Messiah and King of God's creation. This morning, if you've got your Bibles with me, I invite you to turn to Philippians in the New Testament. And we're going to look, as we've, we've read already, but we're going to look at this again in chapter 2, starting in verse 6. And this is a neat, neat passage of Scripture. It's beautiful. It's beautiful as Paul declares the identity of Christ. Hear the word of the Lord this morning in chapter 2, verse 6. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. He made himself nothing. He took the humble position of a slave and he appeared in human form. And, and this, is, this is the good verse here. And in human form, he obediently humbled himself even further by dying a criminal's death on a cross. The scope of Paul's letter to the Philippians is, is really a, it's a joyful letter. You could even say the church in Philippians, like, they were kind of like Paul's crown jewel. They were a church that got it right for the most part. And as we look at the scope of this letter, we see Paul being very thankful. We see, we see chapters on gratitude for they had supported Paul and his ministry. This was a church that was getting it. They were doing it, but he did not pass. He didn't balk at the opportunity in this letter to this church to remind them of Christ's identity, to remind them of the implications for the church as they understand the nature of the kingship of Christ Jesus. And hear this. These words are beautiful. This is known as Paul's hymn within Philippians. It's worded very eloquently. It's poetic in nature. But we're not simply called to admire the wording. Nor are we called to just admire the selflessness of Christ's nature 
as written down. We're not called to read this as if we're staring at a beautiful painting on a canvas. Rather, we're called to read this passage with that understanding of what it means for us as followers of Jesus Christ. It changes the nature of who we are and how we live our lives. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to be obtained, but he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. And he appeared in this form and he humbled himself in obedience to God as he died a criminal's death on a cross. Now Paul wrote this to the church in Philippians and, and we got to acknowledge there weren't, there weren't a whole lot of Jews that were there in this time in this particular church. But I mean, let's look. When we look at Paul's declaration of Christ's identity, it's in sharp contrast to the messianic expectation of who the Messiah would be. For the nation of Israel, they were, they were longing and awaiting this warrior king messiah who would come and just crush the opposition and who would restore the nation of israel to its rightful place mimicking and mirroring the times of when king david ruled but paul's him paul's words in the second chapter of philippians present a messiah who came in the form of a lowly human and who took a posture of humility and a posture of service in many ways echoing John chapter 13, the narrative when Christ gathers with his disciples and he bends down to wash the dirt and the muck from their feet. And he says, now that I have done this for you, you are called to go and do likewise to one another. This Messiah that Paul portrays in the letter to the Philippians is one that presents a radically different view of power and a radically different view of glory as Christ comes and announces the kingdom of God is at hand. For you see, in this kingdom, in the kingdom of God, power, power is associated with service, and glory is associated with humility. On the threshold of Advent, the question this morning is in the depth of your heart, with every ounce of your being and every ounce of your soul, do you truly acknowledge and identify Jesus Christ as your king? Do we acknowledge this and let this live out in our actions? Or are we merely simply staring at a painting and admiring it? Because church, I want to be honest with you this morning. As we approach Advent, there's a sharp difference between admiration and transformation. For when we stare at that beautiful painting, we are called to be transformed by the sacrifice that he gave for each of us as he entered the world and took the lowly position of a human and died on a cross. Because if he's your king, with every ounce of your being, if he is your king, if you identify yourself with him and his reign and his authority and his command, you understand and I understand the notion of go and do likewise. But guys, this, this is where it's tough. This is where it gets dirty. This is where it gets uncomfortable. This is where sometimes it even gets awkward. For the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is not comprised with wealth, but is based upon freely giving to those who have nothing. The kingdom of God is not about fancy goblets, but helping those who thirst for clean water. The kingdom of God is not about me and you and our own well-being, but about the well-being of the others outside of our stained glass windows. This is where the Christ is Lord of your life and your entire existence demonstrates his kingship within you. This is where the kingdom of God is inside you and all around you at all times. Where it's not just located in a building made of wood and stone. This is where Paul's hymn of Christ's identity is your life's model of service and humility. For when Christ is our King, church, we understand what it means when He says, go and do likewise. We act when told to love our neighbor as ourselves. We act when told to serve the last, the least, and the lost. We act when told to go therefore and make disciples. We act when told that pure and lasting religion in the eyes of God our Father is He who will care for the orphans and the widows in their times of need, in their times of distress. We act when told to show the stranger hospitality or to clothe the naked or to visit the prisoner. 
This is when it comes about picking up our own cross and carrying it daily. It's not just something we read about someone else doing. And it's not just an opportunity to stare at a picture when somebody else is doing it. It's an opportunity to truly act when we live within the kingdom of God. When we pick up our cross and where we bear the burdens of others. This is where we remain in Him. And He remains in us. But the question is, how do we remain? How do we remain in Him? And sometimes we try to be our own kings. How do we remain in Him when we submit to our own authority? When it seems that everything around us in the world is trying to sever us from the vine, how is it that we remain in Him? In closing this morning, I want to take a quick look at the scope uh, of a book. It's in the New Testament. It's not necessarily the book that gains the most attention. It's not the source of all the devotions that we read. In your Sunday school class, it, it might have skipped over this one. Uh, it's a book that, to be honest, almost didn't really make the cut. It was probably the last book to be added in the canon as we know it today. It's a book we're not exactly sure who the author was, nor are we exactly sure when it was written or to whom it was written for. But it's a book within three chapters, Second Peter, brings such a message that is relevant to our church today. For we need to hear this. As, as a people, we need to be constantly reminded. For Second Peter is a letter to a church that has an internal struggle. It's a letter to a church, to congregation, and to leadership alike that has begun to turn from their faith. They've begun rejecting Christ's divinity. They've begun seeking out their own authority. They've removed his influence and his calling upon their lives, and they have fallen victim to the world and the world's teachings. You see, church, this was a letter written thousands of years ago to a church that began to focus on itself and not focus on others. And the letter writer tells us that as they did this, they began to live lives of lust sexual immorality, that desire and greed became to replace obedience and selflessness. And in chapter 1 of this letter, they're told, stand firm in the truth. For the power of Christ is your king will protect you. Through his power reigning within you, you will escape the decadence of sin and evil desire that surrounds you. Through your faith, through Christ reigning supreme in your hearts, you will produce a life of moral excellence that you will know God better, that you will demonstrate self-control, and that you will endure. And this is the good part, that godliness will dwell in your heart, and godliness will reign supreme in your soul, and that you will prevail as you begin to take on the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, that you will see the world through the King's eyes, that you will see things just as the suffering servant of Isaiah sees them. The church of 2 Peter had lost its focus. It had lost its understanding as Christ as king, and it had replaced the reign with their own authority, with their own focus, with their own selfish desire, with their own ambitions. And church, I want to be honest with you, as I prepared for this sermon, as I studied these words, I couldn't help but see myself in that church. I couldn't help but hear those words and say, Father, I need to be reminded I need to be reminded of what it means when you are my king. For so often in my own life, I find myself focusing on what makes me happy or what it is that I want to do, and my self-interest grows. And before you know it, I have lost my focus. I am a member of that church in 2 Peter where he writes, you need to be reminded. I need to be reminded. In chapter 1, verse 12, he says this, and I, and I love this passage. Therefore, I intend to keep reminding you of these things, even though you know them already. Even though you get this and you know them already, I intend to continue reminding you of these things. And I think it's right, and I think it's true for me to do this as long as I live. For me to continue reminding you and refreshing your memory of the identity of Christ. And that when you come together to celebrate Christ the King Sunday, that you are to know that it's not just about admiring a painting, but it's about being transformed by your very nature of knowing that Christ reigns within you.
as we enter the season of Advent, as we stand on the threshold of these next four weekends that come, may we enter this season with a posture of humility, with a posture of knowing and identifying ourselves with Jesus Christ. As we sing hymns like, O come, O come, Emmanuel, may our prayer be, Father, transform me from the bondage of the world. Free me from my own perversion. Grant to me the same posture that you gave to that of Christ Jesus. This morning, you may be hearing this message from Philippians and 2 Peter, and maybe you're broken. Maybe you're broken and you need to hear that you have one, a king that is chasing relentlessly after you, that desires to know you in the most intimate ways, to empower you to live within his kingdom. Maybe you're here this morning and you're, you've been hesitant. You've been hesitant to say, God, I'm ready to take this next step and do what it is that you're calling me to do. Know that when Christ is your king and then when he reigns supreme in your hearts, church, we're called to get dirty and sometimes it's going to be awkward. But when he reigns within us, when we truly dwell within his kingdom, there are implications of simply saying that Christ is my king. As we leave today, as we go forth and share in wonderful times of fellowship and love with our families, and as we come back here next Sunday to celebrate the hanging of the greens as we enter a season of Advent, I pray for each of us that we are convicted in that that we are convicted to truly understand and know that we don't simply admire a painting, but when Christ is our King, it means we've been transformed to go and to do likewise. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.